My name is Maureen Haney. Um, I am a program manager for the Tutor.com Government and Federal Programs. And it should come as no surprise to anyone that math is one of our most tutored subjects here at Tutor.com. In the past few years, I have personally gotten a lot of parents of younger students tell me that they are stressed out because they can't help their kids learn this new math. Many of you have access to Tutor.com, which is great. Uh, but Tutor.com is not the focus of the presentation today. This is open to anyone and everyone who's looking for some advice. At Tutor.com, we have a plethora of experts behind the scenes, just like our presenter today, who has years of experience working with students. She's also a math whiz. She loves math, and it is her goal to make you love math, too. So on that note, I would like to introduce Winona Young, who is a mentor manager on our Tutor.com instructional team. Thank you so much, Maureen, and hello to everyone who's participating. I appreciate you dropping by to listen to what we have. Um, this is our Common Core State Standards webinar, and we're calling this one the Mythbusters edition, and we'll get more get to that a little bit later. Just a little bit about me. Um, I am a mentor manager, as Maureen stated. I work for um, on Tutor.com, and my role here really is to support mentors and tutors as they create sound educational experiences for students across the country. I also work to create resources for students and tutors and to support client services in endeavors to bring educational information opportunities to both students and parents, such as this webinar. A little bit about me um, personally, I'm a wife to a disabled Navy vet who served in both Desert Storm and Desert Shield. I'm a mom to two teenagers and a master to a brindle boxer and two guinea pigs. My background is in public education. I spent about 15 years teaching high school math and then another two additional years of academic coaching within my district working with middle school and high school math teachers. I've worked as an adjunct professor and I've traveled to present to teachers and students across the nation. I've co-authored an advanced math class for the Georgia Department of Education and served as a grader of AP exams for the College Board. And I suspect that many of us are similar as we, prior to COVID-19 tra era, traveled back and forth to track meets, basketball games, band concerts, volleyball tournaments, fill in your blanks. We bake, we do laundry, we run businesses, we work toward professional degrees. And you know what else we do? Now we attempt to support our children in this era of digital learning. We've all been quarantined and common core math is staring our darlings right in the face. So as you may suspect, my teenagers are really overjoyed to be home with the math teacher mom. <laughs> Actually, not at all. Um, but I'm here to provide you with resources to help maybe preserve your sanity a little bit and assuage some, some concerns that you may have about the common core standards for math. This is a picture of my family. It's hanging out together at the bowling alley a little bit. So yay, math, said no one ever. Um, but full disclosure, and Maureen alluded to this earlier, I am a full-on math geek, and I have been a proponent for Common Core standards really from the very beginning. As a math educator, the progression of topics as they move from elementary through middle school through high school is really amazing to watch. I understand that everyone does not share my passion for math, and as I would explain to my students, the goal is not necessarily for you to like it, but to be able to know it, to be able to understand and to be able to do math. And so throughout the webinars, you hear certain things or see certain things. I just want you to keep calm because math really does rock. And though I know there are varying opinions out there about Common Core math, I do get the slightest bit offended when I hear that it's wrong. So I've made a mission to debunk some of the myths surrounding Common Core State Standards, specifically those related to math. So listen to that. Buckle up, hold on tight. I want to show you something. So as a result of this training, what we want to accomplish is to help you understand the origins of the Common Core State Standards to help you understand the shifts of mathematics standards in the 21st century, to debunk myths surrounding the Common Core State Standards for Math, and to develop some strategies that would help employ a growth mindset for both you and your children. So let's jump right in. Here's myth number one. Common Core Standards only exist for mathematics. 
Well, here's some facts about the Common Core State Standards for Math. Development actually began in somewhere around 2009, not just for math, but also for ELA. College and career readiness standards, you may know them as CCRS and K-12 content specific standards were developed at that time as well. Teachers with the support of national unions, academic agencies were involved in helping to write these standards, to review them and to revise them over time. And as of today, there are 41 states, four territories and the District of Columbia, also including DODEA, who have adopted these standards. Later, next generation science standards were created. The final adoption took place in 2013 and national curriculum standards for social studies have been around since 1994, even though they were updated in 2010. So every core subject has this set of common standards. So why do we only hear about math? Um, I suspect that it's probably the area that's most different than the way we as parents learn math. So a little bit more on that later. But let's go ahead and put a stop to perpetuating this particular myth. Myth number two, Common Core State Standards for Math is, quote, new math. So in my high school with students would ask me why something existed, I would joke, you know, and say, prior to smartphones, prior to Playstations and Xboxes, there was really nothing better to do than to make new discoveries. And I often imagine that one of these mathematicians was just sitting on the beach in Greece, drawing in the sand and went, whoa, would you look at that? Boom, new math. Now, these guys didn't dig around in the sand for thousands of years for us to consider math to be new. In fact, it's quite rare that new discoveries are made in mathematics. Those that are used, those that are discovered use current methods or advance those methods a little bit. And oftentimes computer trials are used over and over again to reach some valid conjecture about these new ideas. So these are some pictures of some mathematicians, some kind of some bonus points if you recognize any of those faces. I'll give you a little rundown of who we're looking at here. The first guy is Newton. You may know Sir Isaac Newton as being responsible for Newton's laws of motions, but he also was instrumental in helping develop calculus. Next to him, we have Euclid, father of geometry. And then we have Gauss, whose roots are in number theory, geometry, probability. This guy is Pythagoras. And I hear people say all the time, that's the only thing I remember from that. A squared plus B squared equals C squared. And I've never had to use it. Likely not. And then the last one is Descartes. If you've ever had to graph on an XY coordinate plane, you can thank this guy for that. One. Now, I know that was probably a bit too nerdy. You're probably just saying, but we didn't learn the math that they learned in school. Well, that's not exactly true. Our children are still learning the basics of math in elementary school. They're learning counting, they're learning all of the number operations, addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. They're telling time, they're counting money, they're working with fractions and geometry, they're problem solving, and they're even doing algebra. Yes, algebra, as early as kindergarten. This is what our kids are exposed to. So what happened? Well, I'm glad you asked. Shift, as we know, shift happens. And although it can make a mess, shift is not all bad. Our Gen Z kids, you know, the ones who love screen time, speak their minds when unasked and drive us a little bit crazy, where they're craving more and more. Lots of why questions about everything. And Common Core State Standards helps them understand not only the hows of math, but the whys as well. So what's changed from what we learned in math to what's happening with these Common Core Standards? One of the changes has been that we have gone from algorithms only to developing conceptual understanding of those algorithms and then learning the algorithms later. So for example, we learn how to add by carrying, subtract by borrowing. We learn how to multiply using an algorithm. That was all we learned. We didn't learn a whole lot about why those algorithms work, while they, while they, wait, why excuse me, those algorithms work. Unfortunately, um, we didn't. But our kids are, and that leads to a greater foundational understanding. Second thing that changed, um, we had more topics with less focus on those topics. Our kids are now experiencing fewer topics with more focus, and not just more focus, but a broader reach. And they're doing a deep study. And some of those topics start in elementary school and are developed through middle school and 
eventually are used in high school, building on those same concepts they learned in elementary school. Which gets to the next point, we were used to topic isolation. You only learned this in third grade and you only learned this in fourth grade. And once you learned it, that was the end of it. The Common Core State Standards for Math now allow for coherence and progression across all grade levels for these individual topics. And lastly, there was minimal application. I can tell you as a student who loved math all the way through school, I majored in it. The one thing I hated was word problems because word problems forced me to think a little bit more and I couldn't just do those algorithms anymore, which I was very quick and very good at. Common Core State Standards for Math now afford our kids the opportunity to have some broad real world application of the topics that, that they are exploring in class. All of this leads to a greater understanding of mathematical concepts and builds critical thinking along the way. Well, shift. This myth denied. Myth number three. Students are not really, really learning how to do math. Hmm. You may not be aware, but there are literally thousands of teachers across the country who are developing lesson plans that detail what students must know, what they must understand, and what they must be able to do. Prior to the development of the Common Core Math Standards, the curriculum focused a lot on no. That is multiplication facts through 12, adding and subtracting numbers, including fractions, that type of thing. You just need to know how to do these procedural things. In most classrooms, the concern was also to demonstrate understanding. And this was usually through some type of assessment, test, quiz. I'm sure we can remember reciting our multiplication facts and winning prizes for that. But in the US, we fell really short of students being able to demonstrate conceptual understanding and to actually do mathematics. They were un unable to apply and transfer knowledge from situation to situation, whether that was a word problem like I just described or a real life situation. So we came up in an era where we knew how to do things, but had very little understanding or transference skills. So at the elementary school level, we began to introduce students to methods that would increase their number sense. And you may be thinking number sense, um, think common sense, but with numbers. There are certain things we want elementary students to be able to do, including counting, understanding wholes and parts and, and proportional thinking. And I know common sense isn't common, we don't all have it, but we all have the potential to develop it just like number six. And at the elementary age, the brains of kids are still sponges. They're soaking up everything and they're really eager and excited and they're processing information faster that we, than we'll even believe. So here's an example. Shameless plug here, I'll admit, for one of my favorite stores to shop when my kids were younger. As I said, they're teenagers now, so we've outgrown it, but the children's place. Um, let's say the world safely reopens by October, that's my birthday, and I receive this coupon. I visit the store and begin to place all kinds of adorable things in those little bags that they give you. And I'm trying to keep up with how much I'm spending because hubby will see this charge come across the account. Um, so when all is said and done, let's say I spent $79.32. Now, honestly, this is really lowballing. I tend to go crazy in this store. Um, but for the sake of this exercise, we want to keep the number kind of small. Now in school, I learned how to calculate discounts similar to you did. We take the amount, $79.32, and we multiply it by the percentage. Don't forget to turn it into a decimal. And then we get some discount amount. We take that discount amount and we subtract it from the total. And that's your total purchase amount pre-tax. But who actually does that in the store? Pulls out pencil and paper or starts error writing as our eyes move up, down, left, right, trying to keep up with all of the place values. Nobody. Who has time for that? There's so many more stores in the mall. And yes, I have been known to shop for my kids on my birthday. Instead, we can make tens. What? <laughs> make tens? Yeah, you know, like rounding. What's the closest 10? What's the closest 10 that I can get from $79.32? Well, that's 80. So I know my total is close to $80. Kindergarten students across the country are doing this. They're making tens. We have 10 fingers and they're using their counting skills and their fingers, their gross motor skills to literally make 10. So then I know that taking 10% off of a 10, any number that ends in zero, means I can drop the last zero. I learned this maybe fifth and sixth grade after exploring patterns based on taking percentages of tens over time. 
So I know that 10% of 80 is $8, but I have 20%. So 20% is double 10%. So that means my discount must be double eight. So now my discount is $16. So my total is gonna be about $16 lower. I have rounding in mind. So I'm making tens and I'm thinking that 16 is close to 20. It's only four away from 20. So now my new total is about 60 plus four or $64. I know, mind blown, a little crazy, but that took longer for me to explain than we actually calculated in our heads. I know that's not how we learned it, but it's what we developed after we understood how mathematics works, algorithms and then concepts. But our beautiful Gen, D, Gen Z darlings, they're learning to do this before they even hit junior high or middle school. Concepts first, algorithms last. And that's a good thing. Because now not only do students know how, that's procedural fluency, they also uh, um, have an understanding of why, that's conceptual understanding. And then they can transfer that knowledge to new situations. So they really are learning how to do math. I'll take a hard pass on that myth. Myth number four, and this one is really important because as I was, teaching under these common core standards, our state eventually changed the name of them. We'll get to more of that later. But I've had lots of parents say there are no resources. I don't know what to do. I don't, I don't know how to help. And maybe initially there were not. But we're about 11 years removed from the development of these particular standards. And I want you to know that there are resources available. Perhaps your local school district has not released many resources for parents, or maybe you're unaware of what those resources are or where they can be found. But there's a wealth of information available, especially with regard to specific standards by grade level. So let's take a look at a few of these resources that you see on the screen here. This first one is the Common Core website. It includes Common Core state standards for both math and ELA or English language arts. So this is a page of what parents should know. And so it kind of goes through and it details some different things about the standards, including information about DODEA and how they have adopted standards. And then there's other information where you can look specifically at standards by your state. So if you click on the, that link, you can tell across the US which states have adopted and which ones have not adopted, those in the gold color have not adopted. And then you can click on a particular state. I live in Georgia, I can click on Georgia and I can go through and look at a list of those standards. There's also the Council of the Great City Schools, which is really a phenomenal website. This is a website that pulls together information for urban school districts across the nation and they have put together parent roadmaps for the Common Core Standards for Math. So if you have a student that's in kindergarten, first grade, second grade, all the way through to high school math, there's a parent roadmap for you. And I'll just pick one here. I'll pick, say, third grade. And we'll open that up, and we'll open the PDF here. And what it is, it's just a small guide that kind of talks to you about what is my student going to be learning in grade three? Solving two-step word problems using addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. That's something we may not have seen until eighth grade. This is the algebra that I was talking about before. Understanding and identifying a fraction on a number line. Again, these were concepts that may have earlier have been in fourth and fifth grade, but because we're starting at kindergarten with developing these foundational concepts, now our third graders are able to do this with some degree of fluency. And then they give examples of what students should be able to do. Students understand that 15 tens is the same as about five tens plus one ten, that really should say one ten plus five ones. Um, but if they're multiplying, then they kind of get this idea, 15 tens, 150. That's 100, five tens and zero ones, that's a place value. So that's another resource. Um, a fourth one is Great Minds, which is supported by Eureka Math, which is a 
it's kind of like a curriculum, I guess I would say, for math, but they have um, some great information here for parents as well. You can create an account, which is free, and then you can go through, and there are tip sheets. They come in both English and Spanish, which could be beneficial if Spanish is spoken in your home. There's also information about homework helpers. Now, these would have to be purchased, but a lot of the tips they give on here are free, and these are great guides. Another great resource that parents don't think about often is PTA. PTA is known for being a support for parents, teachers, and students across the nation. And PTA has even created some guidelines for parents going from K-8 to high school that are available based on the Common Core standards. So here's one, I did third grade last time, here's one for fifth grade. And we can go through and we can look at this guide. And again, it's just really short. It just kind of gives an overview, information on how I can help. Here's information on math. What will my child be working on? What are some examples of what that information may look like? And the last one is LearnZillion. LearnZillion is actually instructional videos that are recorded by teachers. And again, they are available free of charge. And I just kind of pulled this one up to show what a problem may be looking may look like in a classroom. I believe this is a uh, second grade classroom. And so I'm just going to kind of fast forward through this. During, se during second grade lunch, the cafeteria sold 43 white milks and 25 chocolate milks. How many milks did the second grader buy? So what we walk through here is this idea that we're probably bashing our heads against the wall over why can't they just line them up and add like we did. Well, they learn based on place value. So we start with 43 and we understand that that's four tenths and three ones. And we know that there were 25 chocolate milks. We understand that to be two tenths and five ones. So because the students are learning by place value, they're adding by place value. There's four tenths and two tenths. So that makes six tenths. And then there's three ones and five ones. So that makes eight ones. When I put those six tenths with those eight ones, I have 68 milks. Now it's actually the same thing we do in the algorithm. We were just taught, start with the ones place. If there's anything more than 10, carry the one, add that at the tens place. Don't forget the one you carry. We learned this algorithmically with not a lot of information about place value. So remember to use your local resources as well. Connect your, um, contact your classroom teacher. If your classroom teacher doesn't have information, maybe you can browse your district's webpage. Understand that not all states use common core state standards. In other words, you might your standards in your state might not be called CCSS. For example, here in Georgia, the standards are called GSE, which stands for Georgia Standards of Excellence. In Texas, they're called TEX, T-E-K-X, Texas Essential Knowledge and Skills. DODIA calls them CCRS, College and Career Readiness Standards. In your state, they may be called something different. You can just browse or Google math standards to get an idea of what's available to parents in your state. So we're going to say absolutely not. This myth is not true. So we've debunked four myths. So the big question is, well, what can I do at home? What I want to focus on today is this idea of growth mindset. How can we support our children by help? by helping to promote positive thinking about their math ability, as well as positive thinking about your own math ability. So Carol Dweck is an educational researcher and she focuses on this idea of growth versus fixed mindset. So for example, a fixed mindset, we say intelligence is static, meaning I can't, I, I'm born with being naturally smart or something like that. Growth mindset says it's expandable. I, I want to learn more. The fixed mindset said avoid challenge. Oh, that's too hard. I don't want to do the, the problems in the book with the extra star. The growth mindset embraces those challenges. Fixed mindset gives up pretty easily when things get hard. Growth mindset persists in the face of setbacks. Um, and you can see the rest there listed in the table. But in efforts to instill resiliency, grit, positive self-esteem in our children, we want to also adopt a growth mindset as parents. And believe it or not, it actually begins with how we speak about math. Do any of these sound familiar to you? I'm just not good at math. Do you feel that way? Or I'm just not a math person. I, I, I was never good at math. Or I wasn't born with the math gene. When we impose our beliefs, concerns, previous experiences about math in general on our children, 
they tend to take on those same beliefs. There's such a stigma surrounding the ability to learn math that many people believe that they really are just bad at math. But research has shown that there is a link between growth mindset and math success. We want kids to feel confident and we want them to experience success as they learn math. Those who have a growth mindset about their math abilities tend to perform better and are more engaged in the math lessons. The truth is at some point we all faced a time when math became hard. For some, it was when we first encountered fractions. For others, <clears throat> me, it was the year that the numbers disappeared from math. That was advanced calculus junior year of college. It was really scary. Um, but the key is to prepare our children and ourselves to face these challenges with the growth mindset and a healthy attitude towards math. They would develop stamina and persevere through problem solving, which is one of the eight standards of mathematical practice. So here are some ways you can help. So this one is based on student and teacher language, but parents can use the same language. So if your child says, I'm just not good at this, you can encourage your child by saying something like, well, nobody is good at it in the beginning. Let me ask you some questions so we can figure out what you're missing. Or if your child says, you know, it's good enough, I don't wanna do anymore. You can encourage your child, and I do this with my kids too, and there's a great book, this is good isn't good enough, it's a great book. Um, but this might be your best by today's standards. As you get better, it will become your second best. Or if your student says, this is too hard, you can say, well, it, it's meant to be hard. We grow by challenging ourselves. I'll never be that smart. Being smart is something you learn. Let me teach you or let me help you be smarter. So this, a, a change in the language is a change in the mindset. It really begins with the language itself. And here are some other options for you as well. There's a great website that talks about the five powerful ways to help kids develop growth mindset, specifically in mathematics. So there are five different ways, and I won't read all of this, the tiny print underneath, but you do have this link in your resources. One, teach your kid about the brain's ability to grow. Help them understand that intelligence and knowledge is not static. Maybe certain people click with ideas faster than others. That doesn't necessarily mean that because I learned it slower or I learned it later that I'm not smart. It just means that it took me some time and my brain may develop a little bit differently than somebody else's brain. The brain grows it's like a muscle. The more you exercise it, the better it gets. The second tip is to model and praise mistakes as opportunities for brain growth. Even in the role that I do now with tutor.com, I mentor and support um, people on various levels. And one of the statements that I make is sometimes we win and sometimes we learn. We never lose. And I can give you all kinds of acronyms like fail, first attempt at learning. No, next opportunity. So those are growth mindset ideas. So model and praise mistakes as opportunities for growth. Three, and we'll work on this in the, in the next series a little bit because I recognize we're not teachers, but we are parents, provide rich open-ended math tasks. Um, and this is the idea of creating a deeper love for mathematics. I will admit, if you're not a math person, you may not be able to come up with these. But one thing you can do in this last bullet point under number three is to challenge kids to create their own problems ask them to write new similar questions but more difficult this is something that i did in my classroom with students all the time and because they want to try and trick their friends they don't want their friends to be able to get the answer they would try to make the problem as hard as possible but they're learning along the way step four remove an emphasis on speed now this one is probably challenging for us because we all took those timed math fact tests you have like 50 addition problems and you have like five minutes to get them all done you know, it's not really about the speed. It's really about looking for multiple solutions, opening their minds and expanding their minds to new ideas. So let's remove that emphasis of getting it done quickly. And lastly, and we talked about this earlier, just be mindful of your own attitude towards math. If we are putting our own beliefs or our predisposed notions about math on our kids, especially if those are negative experiences, we serve as the authority in the home and they go, oh, well, if mom can't do it, I, I must not be able to do it. Or if dad can't do it, I, I'm not gonna be able to do it either. Or it's okay because mom was bad at math, so I'm just gonna be mad, bad at math as well. We definitely want to avoid imposing that on our kids. 
So what do we want you to leave this webinar knowing? Well, we want you to know that the Common Core State Standards for Math are not new. Um, our children are actually learning math and they are actually learning the math that we learned when we were in school. Maybe they're going about it a different way, but they are actually learning. And thirdly, we can help them do so using any available resources and by developing a math mindset. And if there's anything we can do to help, don't hesitate to reach out to us at one of these email addresses. If you're watching the recording on a playback, you can also use these to request a PDF of the resources. We will have a couple of additional webinars that get more specific into the carrying and the borrowing and also ways that our students are multiplying and those will come up next week. So we definitely invite you to those. So thank you so much for your time and we will stop and take questions now. Thank you so much, Winona. And um, so like Winona said, we will be having two more webinars. One is Tuesday, April 28th, what happened to carrying and borrowing. Uh, and this, the next one is, the third one is gonna be Thursday, April 30th, which is, that's not how you multiply. So that's gonna delve a little bit more into the details of how your child is learning the math and what's going on there. Um, we couldn't, didn't wanna fit it all into one webinar and make it a really, really long webinar. So that's why we are breaking this up like that. Um, but I do have uh, a couple of questions for you here, Winona. So okay. um, my child's teacher talks about skip counting. What is that? And I imagine you might be covering that a little bit more next week, but can you touch on it a little bit? Sure, so skip counting is what we learned as counting by twos or counting by threes or counting by fives. Two, four, six, eight, who do we appreciate? I remember, I don't know if I got it from Sesame Street or just something I, I learned. I used to love to count by fives. I, I, you know, I, I would like sing song it, five, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40, 45, 50. I don't know where I got that from, but that's skip counting. It's an introduction to the multiplication facts without calling them the multiplication facts. And students actually learn this as early as kindergarten. Great, okay. Um, and then we have another question. How do I get my fourth grader more excited about math? Great <laughs> yeah, question. <laughs> um, here's what I'll tell you, just in, in full disclosure again, I taught high school, but I have been in, in several elementary classrooms and student, there is a certain point where the excitement kind of goes away. But I can tell you again, with, with our generation of kids that we're raising, they want to see the point of it. They're like, why am I doing this? What's the point of it? Why does it matter? So I would do things with my kids. Like when I was cooking, we would pull out the measuring cups and I would say, well, I need a half a cup of this but you can't use a half a cup. You have to use a fourth of a cup. So I need you to tell me how many fourths of a cup I need for this recipe and we can't make the recipe up. And it's exciting because they were helping me to learn to cook and they kind of knew they were doing math, but it, you know, it helped them with this idea of equivalent fractions. So if you can think of activities such as that, it, it would be helpful to kind of get them more excited because they can see an, an instantaneous, gratification and instantaneous application of what they're learning. Now, we'll be honest, it backfired on me once. Um, my son, we were teaching them serving sizes with their snacks and we had bought a, a huge bag of M&Ms. And so the serving size was only like, maybe let's say it was like a fourth of a cup or something like that. And I gave him an eighth of a cup and I was like, here, you just use one of these. And he says, well, why? I said, he put two cups in for his serving. I said, well, why are you doing two cups? He says, well, mommy, it's a fourth as a serving size. And you only gave me a one eighth cup. So I need two of these. So that's what happens when you try to teach them <laughs> that it might backfire on you a little bit. So just be careful with that. All right, thanks for the warning. We don't want to o OD on M&Ms while we're trying to learn. Um, so I have one more, which is kind of a similar question, actually. All of my third, all my third grade daughter wants to do is read. How do I engage her with math activities instead? Same, same yeah. principle. <laughs> that, you know what? That's a really good question as well. And Maureen, I will add to the resource list, and maybe we can we can post it. There is a series of books that are catered toward elementary school children that are beautiful. 
as it relates to math. The one series I'm thinking of is Sir Conference, and it's kind of like this um, Knights of the Round Table theme, but it talks about circumference and it talks about pi and it talks about diameter, diameter and, and there's a mission. Um, but there's, I will make a list of books that you can begin to look into because we don't want to take away the love for reading and we don't want to say, well, you can't read so much because you have to do math. We're going to find a way to maybe intermingle the two so she can still enjoy the love of reading, but learn something about math along the way. All right, that's excellent. So um, that's all the questions that we have right now. We'll give people another minute to, to type in their questions while we wrap it up here. Um, and what we will do is uh, if you want to type up that list and if anybody's interested in getting that list, they can email us. Do you have another slide, uh, Winona, with my email on it for this in this presentation or I did I see that? For you okay, right great. Here. All right, so if anybody wants to get those resources, they can email me um, or they can respond uh, also to the email that they got with their confirmation for registration. Um, so we'd also like to hear from you on any future ideas you have for webinars, anything that anyone would like to learn more about uh, that one of our experts could help you with. Um, to register for the future webinars, if you the, the carrying and borrowing and the multiplying, um, you can find the 